privacy the way they once did, especially if they're being told that this is the way you consume and everybody's got to put up, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. And only now are some of them finding out when they get a little older that a snotty teenage comment you made on Facebook can cost you a job as an adult or get you thrown out of college. Prospective employers now mine MySpace and Facebook and the other things like it looking for dirt and looking for people not to hire. Never mind who might be best for the job, let's see how they screwed up and disqualify them that way. In a weird way, though, I do look forward to the day when something like this happens to some family values politician or right-wing Supreme Court nominee, and suddenly they go down in flames like the Hindenburg when somebody finds out about all the animals they bragged they had sex with while drunk on their Facebook page as a teenager. On the other hand, does this mean, if we're going to participate in this network, that we all have to be as paranoid about our every single thing we do from childhood, or, you know, just like some egomaniac who's planning to run for president in 30 years, we all have to be that careful and walk on eggshells, even in our own bedrooms, imprison ourselves in a constant state of, I tried, but I didn't inhale. I mean, that, that, being washed like that, having to worry about that, is even crueler than the Catholic Church. And with no chance to confess and magically make everything all better. I mean, that is hardly my idea of expanding democracy. And Google, among others, has made it their business to collect and store and sell more information about you and everything you've bought and everything you read than the FBI, the CIA, and the Keystone Stormtroopers at Homeland Security combined. And Facebook, as many of you know, launched their beacon service last year, notifying users' friends of a person's online purchases without their permission, thus exposing in advance who's, what you're going to get for Christmas from those people. But what if you look up, oh, this friend who you've been going out with who's on your Facebook page just bought a pregnancy test and you've been out of town for a month. Yeah, and you thought Obama voting to let the NSA spy on us was your worst problem. This is how we volunteer to be violated by these people. Anna Lee, I hope I say her last name right, Newitz? Navitz? Anyway, uh, who until recently wrote for the San Francisco Bay Guardian and was the best thing in the paper, she had an interesting comment about this. The more public our friend lists are, the more we feel like we have to pick our friends based on public opinion. That's not expanding democracy, that's high school. Facebook and MySpace and the others are all good tools, of course, to expand what you know and who you know, but if that's all people want to know, again, they're dumbing themselves down and we can't let that happen. We can't be in the information age and allow people to know less and less and less. Is this much screen suckling making people smarter or is it making people dumber? And I will use some of the same examples I used last time because if anything, this has gotten worse. Oh, did you talk to that person? Yeah, I talked to him. Well, what did they say? Well, I didn't talk to him, I just emailed them. That's not talking to somebody. Sending an email, not waiting for a reply and assuming your job is done Wrong. Communication is an equation. You got to get the other half of the communication or you have not communicated. And just, you know, sitting there day after day, didn't you get my email? Didn't you get my email? I mean, if you're that desperate, call them on the phone. And in the age of instant messaging, it's amazing how this works. You ask somebody something on the phone, they answer you instantly and you know what you can do instantly after that is to ask them another question and they answer it and you can ask them another question and you've saved yourself weeks of snitty emails to get more stuff done um an ex-girlfriend of mine in la said she was out at a club seeing a band a while back and a woman came up to her chatted her up they hit it off really well she tells the other woman her name oh you're my myspace friend and then the other woman walked away 
It's like, oh, I just didn't want to actually talk to you or find out you were real. I just wanted your picture in my gallery of virtual friends where I feel more comfortable and oh, these are my special friends because they never talk back to me. I love my friend collection, my trophy room. Used to be that living in a world of imaginary friends was considered a mental illness. Text, text, texty, text, 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 text. I'm 20 yards away from you at the mall, but I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> or worse, text, texty, text, text. Jello, where are you? I'm waiting at the train station. I call the person back. Another one, zip. I'm waiting at the train station. Well, I'm trying to call you, but your phone turned off. Zip. I'm waiting for the tra train station. Why didn't you text me? I was standing right over there. Well, why didn't you just come up and talk to me and tell me who you were? Dumb. I mean, the California teenagers went on the news and were outraged when the law went through that you couldn't be yapping on your phone while holding your phone to your ear while you're driving, saying, that's not going to stop me. I know my rights. If somebody texts me, I'm going to text them back right then and there, even if I'm driving through a major intersection in mom's SUV. Wham! And... You know, it's interesting though, the language, the texting is, you know, when you get kind of tired of it after a while but won't admit it, you keep shortening words and shortening words, new abbreviations and new language and all. Maybe it'll be like Chinese and Japanese and Korean characters, who knows eventually. But some of these abbreviations, I mean, it, it feeds this impulse in Americans to abbreviate their brains and abbreviate the amount of time they think, too. Carbohydrates. Very few people knew or cared what that was. But as soon as it was shortened to carbs, everyone was deathly afraid of them for about two years. Now, short attention span America has been treated to Washington Mutual, the bank, shortening their name to WAMU to be better understood by short attention span people. Hi, I need to get into my account and talk about something. What's your social? What do you mean? What's your social? I don't know what a social is. What is a social security number? Oh, too many syllables. Now I understand. Okay, fine. I mean, the, and the other hand, there was a research firm called, what, Bassex in Silicon Valley, who did research on some people who both live and work on the net and concluded that a typical information worker checks their email at least 50 times a day or over once every 10 minutes, and sends instant messages 77 times a day, and stops at 40 websites, and that all these interruptions and loss of concentration, mostly due to stuff that wasn't that important in the first place, costs US business over $650 billion a year. And people take it home with it, too, you know, laptops on the plane, the child has a toy laptop to, imit to imitate their go, go, go mom, laptops at the beach. The Guardian in Britain has come up a, with a great term for some of this. So I must ask, are you a crackberry addict? Crackberry addicts who have to have their blackberry right by their bed or under their pillow, even in the middle of the night, zzz, you got a text message. Oh, I better answer that right away. Oh, I better answer that right away. A crackberry addict. Some say, people in the psychology field are calling this ringsiety. And even I have discovered that sometimes I feel vibrations in my pocket and reach in and, oh my God, got me again, phantom phone syndrome. A recognized medical malady now. San Francisco Chronicle reported that so far this year, two professional bloggers have died from lack of sleep. They did stock market ticks or something where seconds count, and a 40-year-old one almost died when he had a heart attack. So I must ask, does the, black, does the crackberry life get you ahead, or is the world just passing you by? I mean, and if we keep getting this my spaced out, text, 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 instant this, instant that, we're kind of missing everything else and are that much easier to manipulate. And what are we creating here when the cyber world, an instant blipping and bloop, blooping, 
is more real than reality. What happens when these people are in charge? An example of what happens when someone is so completely disengaged, they live in a virtual world all their own, who just bounces from one childish impulse to another. Granted, the origins are different. Perfect example of this is when you hand somebody like that something really important. Look no further than the red, white, and blue Caligula himself. Giant Stanley and Bush. You know, people are so into Obama, they forget who is still president and could bomb Iran anytime. The problem with the French is they don't have a word for entrepreneur. <laughs> Some of these are new quotes, too. They, they, they stopped printing a lot of them once he was in the White House, but they still keep coming out. If the Iranians were to have a nuclear weapon, they could proliferate. <laughs> It is clear our nation is reliant upon big foreign oil. More and more of our imports come from overseas. <laughs> Will the highways on the internet become more few? <laughs> I know how hard it is for you to put food on your family. <laughs> I haven't had this much fun with creative mutilation of the English language since my sophomore year in high school when I had this geometry teacher whose parents were from Norway, but he was from Minnesota and talked like all the characters in the Fargo movie. <laughs> and, and he had, in the, in the 70s, the bell-bottom 70s, he had baggy Charlie Chaplin pants and a white shirt and a skinny tie with a flannel hunting shirt over it, a disproportionately small, turtly-looking head and wavy widow's peak hair on top, and started out just seemingly as a dull math class or something, but a few weeks in, things began to get more and more interesting. Yeah. We're talking about the angle C A B. Excuse me, B. Angle A D. Boy, am I having a time today. And then it grew and grew and grew. And luckily, me and another friend in an earlier class period started writing his quotes down. So I had a notebook an inch and a half thick by the end of the year. And with such a pearls of wisdom and words to live by as his ongoing battle with congruent triangles. Now, we working with Klangagi Trubers. No, 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 no. Congruent triangles, er, sanguine triangles, er, congruent, er, er, drag, er, er, where was er, excuse me, I. Oh, yes, triangles, no, tringlers. Oh, no, trianglers. Oh, I can't even try. <laughs> we can multiply. No, 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 yes! We can mullyplurg, or murify, or multiply. Oh, multiply if the indexes are the term. And then the Freudian slips about food, sex, and Watergate began to come out. <laughs> so, let's plug in the cabbage, nig nig, a babaronk, er, values, and sue what we can do. Now you can't, oh gee, can't lure a radicler in the derominator. And then finally, one day, he comes out and asks the class, Ober diampus blabby dwerp. <laughs> Not one word of English left in the entire sentence. And I did some of the shows in Norway where I asked Norwegians, look, is this actually Norwegian? He said, no. <laughs> Nor is asking the class, poofy snibble abby glob, Norwegian. Nor is asking the class, diggle ab wubba too, nab radical boo, Norwegian. Nor is it Norwegian to burst into song in the middle of a problem and serenade the class with rubber gloves, rubber gloves, sautéed over, night nubble fire, rubber gloves, rubber blocks, sautéed over, open fire. Why do? Can't? Shouldn't I eat it? Extend that. We've got another quadratic. So we all equal 32. One.
one more. Wouldn't be the first time that I've been onion. No, 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 wrong. Ship, Barbie nipple dog dude. Bush. The relation, this, is, this quote is about 10 days old. The relationship between the United States and Europe is the broadest and most vibrant it has ever been. What? I mean, remember when he said that when he met Vladimir Putin, I looked into his eyes and I saw his soul. <laughs> what is less widely publicized is what Putin had to say about Bush. A while back, he compared Bush to, quote, a madman running about with a razor in his hand. <laughs> No one needs to tell me what I believe, but I need somebody to tell me where Kosovo is. And this is who's in charge of a war. And we've got him and his wisdom and the evil regents around the clown prince for six more months and they're hell-bent on finding an excuse to attack Iran. Bush was even asked, well, what does your father think of what you're doing over there? Oh, there's a higher father I appeal to. And then he, uh, the, you know, they got to jump all over people like John Kerry or Jesse Jackson or uh, Kanye West or the Dixie Chicks for one patriotically incorrect thing. But then in the 04 election, Bush actually got away with telling a group of Amish people on the campaign trail in July of 2004, I trust God speaks through me. Yeah. What? Is this why he's never wrong and has no regrets about anything he does? Is because, you know, everything he does, and any time you question him, you're questioning the will of the Almighty? We can think of somebody else with that exact same mentality who's caused similar problems, and his name is Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Bob Woodward, in the second of the three books he wrote about the Bush administration, after he went into Iraq, he asked the clown prince, how is history going to judge what you've done here? We don't know, or I'll be dead. <laughs> what? Six more months, people. Is he one of these last generation nut jobs? He already has a guy who should still be in jail for contragate crimes, Elliot Abrams, as the Undersecretary of State for Middle Eastern Affairs, having regular meetings with the Christian right and the Jewish right to get everybody on the same page as to where Israel's borders should be when the Messiah comes back. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 what happens if somebody does put in Bush's little pea brain, you know, well, maybe you are the Antichrist. We do, you, you want, you want uh, the rapture to happen, don't you? You want Jesus to come back, don't you? Well, yeah, I've been waiting to take him around the ranch in my golf cart called Gator. <laughs> well, you know, for that, you need the rapture, George, and for that, you need Armageddon, George. Come on, George, push the buttons, George. <laughs> then you, you blow up the world hundreds and hundreds of times with all of our weapons of mass destruction, then you can be commissioner of baseball in heaven. <laughs> Six more months. I mean, some of this end time stuff is kind of cool. I kind of like the rapture in a way. All the hardcore fundamentalist bigot believers who go so far out of their way to make everybody else so miserable, all rising up into the heavens at once, like in a Jack T. Chick comic book, all rising into the heavens naked to leave the rest of us to put the planet back together in peace. That I don't mind. Armageddon could really ruin your shopping day. It could really wreak havoc with your Facebook and MySpace pages if everything melts. So what do we do when we're still under the iron fist of a bush, a dick, and a colon? <laughs> and I bring colon back because Obama's hanging out with him now. The rest of the world and all the craziness doesn't stop just because we're having a tabloid circus of an election whose cycle goes on way, way, way too long just so the election industrial complex can make money and everybody's so sick of the evil of two lessers that they don't vote at the end. No, this isn't just against Bush. Even if he's not on TV anymore, we are still left with Bushism itself. 
and a very spineless response on what supposedly is the other side. How many of you are as sick of this stuff as I am? How many of you care enough to get up your ass and do something about it? How many of you think our drug laws are totally insane? How many of you think the war on terror, or twat for short, especially what we're doing in Iraq, is totally insane? How many of you refuse to live under the thumb of a Stone Age Supreme Court who think a bunch of old men have a desi to decide what every single woman does with her own body? Yeah. How many of you think the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, and this new wiretapping legalization should all be flushed down the toilet? Yeah. All of it. And how many of you believe that one of the countries in the world most urgently in need of a real regime change is this one? So how many of you are registered to vote? I think I saw less than half the hands in this room go up. You know, oh, you don't even want to vote for Ron Paul to show how independent you are? You don't even bother to do that? There's the problem. I'm not just for insurrection in the streets, which I have a soft spot in my heart for, but take the Fifth Amendment on on some things. I also believe in insurrection in the voting booth. We need both to get anything done. I would rather vote for what I want and not get it than vote for something I don't want and get it. And even though I throw up my hands at the big national offices, except for the alternative candidates, um, the, the reason to vote is local elections. Yeah. It matters who's mayor. It matters who's on the city council, the county commissioners, and state legislators. Finally, you get rid of Joseph Bruno in New York. Hopefully, there's going to be something to done to save rent control around here. That's why you got to pay attention to these people and vote on these things. Plus, we have a privilege in this country that people don't have in Canada or any European country I know of, the ballot initiative, the referendum, the propositions where at the city level, county, state, you can vote yes or no on a controversial law that legislators are too corrupt and chicken shit to vote on themselves. And since hardly anybody shows up to vote in local elections, and means that if more people like us get still more people like us to register and get off their ass and show up and vote smart, we stand a much better chance of getting somebody cool elected, good laws passed, and taking back our country and our society from the ground up. Far less people in this country support the religious right than we are led to believe, but they have used this tactic very, very effectively to get power in way disproportionate to their numbers, and there's a lot more of us than there is of them, and we are not using our power in this area. This isn't all red cartoon time, like red states versus the blue states, although if you look at what people actually believe in red states and blue states, we're mostly pro-choice, pro-environment, wanted Bush impeached over spying, want to get out of Iraq, and uh, tolerant of gay people getting married, believe it or not, according to the Pew Foundation. Anyway, this is not red states, blue states, it's not donkeys and elephant, or left, right, or black, white. This is a contest, a war, between the top and the bottom. I hate to use an old radical cliche like class war, but that's exactly what's being waged in this country against almost everybody who lives in this country. I'm hoping this whole anti-war and anti-Bush surge 
will surge all the way into reigniting and spreading as never before the anti-corporate movement, the anti-globalization movement. As Ralph Nader puts it, corporations should be our servants, not our masters. And we are not alone in believing that. I mean, even a lot of people who take Rush Limbaugh seriously, they're worried about the same things. It's just that their anger is being channeled into hate and race baiting and picking on poor people. They're worried about food being put on the table. And they're told to blame immigrants and minorities instead of the corporations who are shipping jobs overseas, gutting the unions and stealing their pension funds and taking away their health care. And every time we buy any of those people's products, we are their serfs. Not alone and other people in the world, I'm going out on a limb this time because I don't know my digital issues that well, and you keep bringing me here anyway. But <laughs> theoretically, it is a good thing that Cuba and Venezuela are giving Microsoft the finger and ditching Windows for open source. Yeah. Yeah. Bush and Cheney announced about a year ago the creation of AFRICOM, African Command. We have a Northern Command of the Army for the Northern Hemisphere, CENTCOM for the Middle East, trying to colonize them, keep them under our corporate thumb. Now, since there's oil in Africa and we want to plunder it before the Chinese or India does, we have to have troops all over Africa. So AFRICOM is created, but one problem. Now it's come out, but only in the foreign press, from where I can find it, is they had to give up on having AFRICOM headquarters in Africa because no African country would let us in to build the thing. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> Africa will be governed from Stuttgart, apparently. <laughs> and then there's people you know, who were inspired by the so-called spirit of Seattle, the attacks on the G8 and corporations still going on all over the world, people pulling up frankenfood crops in Brazil, India, Scotland, France, and Scotland, Blair tried to prosecute people for pulling up plants under anti-IRA terrorism laws. I don't know what the outcome of that is. But anyway, well, this is an example of the people being inspired to, you know, you look at the big picture, it's pretty damn depressing. But that isn't stopping people from breaking off a piece of the puzzle, taking a piece of the big picture, and fighting smaller, winnable, local battles, one by one, brick by brick. Corporations are trying to make everybody's water supply privatized. No more public service, no more sense of community, for thereby they take it over, they lay people off, and they double the price of the water. In Bolivia, that was rioted away, and Bechtel had to flee the country. Uruguay, they knew enough to put it to a vote, and Uruguayans voted no way to privatizing the water. This belongs to the people. Now it's even happened in America, where Stockton, California, and even Atlanta, Georgia, have kicked out the privateers, rolling it back. Ever heard of a little town called Petrero, California, 45 miles out in the desert east of San Diego? Their county commissioners thought it would be a great idea to have Blackwater put up a huge privatized military training base to train mercenaries there to go after illegal immigrants and kill them off Blackwater style and stuff. People responded by recalling all five county commissioners who voted yes and throwing Blackwater out of town. <laughs> Heard of the coalition of Immokalee workers from Immokalee, Florida, who've gone through all kinds of hell, especially out in the fields where they pick the tomatoes that go into McDonald's burgers, Burger King, and the rest, they rose up without support of any of the big unions in a campaign that was only went through college campuses, no corporate media coverage, not even Bill O'Reilly or Glenn Beck to try and bash them out of existence. And uh, sure enough, campuses began kicking Taco Bell out of the quad. 
Taco Bell agreed to raise the tomato pickers' wages and do business with the coalition of Immokalee workers. McDonald's didn't even fight when they targeted them next. They just did it. Burger King did fight in the point of hiring spies to go after the organizers.